So I begin by declaring this a period, an era unparalleled of financial disorder. Indeed, the modern age of central banking, now in its fourth century, may be characterized by the rise and fall of real money. To historians, every decade is said to be preoccupied by specific issues. For example, from 2008 to 2013, international economic issues focused on quantitative easing and the fluctuating purchasing power of the dollar. But the focus turns now from the fall to the rise of the dollar exchange rate and the consequence of its instability. On domestic issues, government economists, the academics, and the talking heads of bubble vision are today focused on what they are pleased to call modest price inflation. Let it be said, however, that financial market participants know that instead of Federal Reserve quantitative easing not being expressed in the CPI, it is expressed in the successive price rises of speculative hedges such as commodities, foreign exchange, equities, bonds, farmland, real estate, and art, among other vehicles. These are the vehicles used by the so-called carry trades of the speculative and financial class empowered as they are by near zero interest rates. The financial class gets the cheap Fed credit first, enabled thereby to front run the Fed's massive securities purchases. And then with the proceeds of new sales, they profitably arbitrage the prices of related assets and securities. In fact, Excess cash balances created by quantitative easing were reabsorbed during the past five years by the rising asset prices of the rich and by the export of excess dollars abroad through their overall U.S. balance of payments deficits. These deficit payments themselves being partially financed by rising prices until a short while ago, the emerging market prices began to rise commodity prices again, foreign exchange rates, and economic growth in the emerging markets themselves. At the moment, some of these trends are in reverse, making for reciprocal dangers. A word about the CPI. Savvy statisticians have impeached the U.S. government methodology to, to compute the consumer price index. For example, using the methodology of CPI computation in 1980, CPI inflation would have been close to 10%. Using the government methodology of 1990, CPI inflation would have been closer to 6%. Whatever and wherever the inflation, workers earning fixed salaries and wages and those living on pensions and fixed incomes know that their paychecks and their minuscule income from savings do not keep up with their expenses, which must be paid for at rising true market prices. And working people have also discovered that the creditworthy liquid financial class with access to cheap money at the Fed and at the banks has enriched itself not only by bailout subsidies, but by cheap financing derived from its symbiotic dependence on the Federal Reserve System. This a fundamental cause of the rising inequality of wealth in America. But it is also true that fears of deflation persist in the world of commodities, equities, emerging countries, and at the central banks. They haunt the Fed and the financial markets, not least because foreign economies try to adjust to the unpredictable and disorderly fall, and now the rise of the dollar on the foreign exchanges. Indeed, manipulated floating exchange rates engage all the demonic forces of latent mercantilism and foreign exchange controls, the combination of which has the power to destroy the international trading system, as in fact it did during the interwar period from 1920 to 1940. 
So let me touch briefly on only a few of these subjects, others during our discussion. In the full light of history, the past century has been preeminently the era of financial disorder, an era inaugurated by World War I, a catastrophic and suicidal act of the West entailing the self-immolation of the European great powers. It destroyed not only much of European civilization and the flower of its manhood, but it also destroyed the monetary system associated with its unprecedented growth and prosperity, namely the classical gold standard. World War II and its aftermath were the next acts of this unfolding tragedy as all European countries struggled with inflationary disorders during the war-torn 1940s and the reconstruction efforts of the 1950s. The experts call this period, this early post-war period, the permanent, I quote them, the permanent scarcity of the dollar. Remember that the US economy in 1945 dominated the planet as no country of history, accounting for about 50% of world output and about 75%, perhaps as much as 80% of global gold reserves. For 15 years, from 1945 to 1960, the gold-linked dollar of the post-war Bretton Woods system remained a reasonably stable epicenter around which other fluctuating currency systems orbited quite unsteadily. It should be emphasized that the Bretton Woods gold exchange system was a reserve currency system based on the hegemonic dollar. It had been erected upon the rickety foundation of the post-World War I reserve currency system designed at Genoa in 1922. The Genoa system itself, Jerry built upon the official reserve currency role, primarily of sterling, but also of the dollar. Both currencies being official substitutes for pre-war settlements in gold of residual balance of payments deficits. Now, it was from 1945 to 1958 that the reasonably stable Bretton Woods dollar did dominate global trade and exchange as the world struggled to recover from World War II. But after 1958, a momentous monetary event took place. Western European governments restored the mutual convertibility of their currency systems on current account, sponsored by the European Payments Union, abolished most exchange controls, and sought to establish budgetary equilibrium at home. Promptly, dollar primacy began to wane. From that very year, 1958, when the once prostrate nations of Europe hardened the convertibility of their national monies, the European nations accelerated their post-war rise in world markets. And then, and then, it was the United States which began to experience near permanent overall balance of payments deficits and budget deficits. Now, throughout the 1960s, under Presidents Kennedy and Johnson, inflation and the external deficit of the dollar generated by expansive US monetary policies and budget deficits led to perennial, perennial foreign exchange crises and ultimately to foreign exchange controls. Foreign exchange controls in the United States. The Bretton Woods system groaned under the flood weight of excess US dollars going abroad, where perforce, they were accumulated in the official foreign exchange reserves of our trading partners.